Okay, good morning. Hola. If you would open your Bibles to Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Can't hear you. All right. Psalm 90. All right. Um, this is actually part of a series. This is just this is on individual Sunday school lesson, but um, we'll be starting off with uh, words and context this coming week. So next Sunday is when we'll start off our new series as far as words and context. By the way, um, if you guys have any suggestions as far as stuff that you would want to study, uh, just write them out on a three five by three by five card, or just mention it to myself or the pastor as far as things that you would want to have. Mention it to addressed. Charlie because I'll forget it. Okay, <laughs> then just bring it to me. Uh, either you could just mention it to me in person, or preferably like uh, write it down and then just that way um, you know we can we can answer some questions that you might have about just whatever. So, um, anything that you would like to see covered or studied, just go ahead and let me know. So, anyway, Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Uh, beginning in, well, just beginning verse 1, it says, A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Okay, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest to the destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as asleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth, and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down, and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath we are troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in, the, in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the anger of, or excuse me, who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. And then here are some desires that he calls out to God for. So, one, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Okay, make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us in the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children, and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. All right, so this is Moses' prayer uh, to the Lord. And we're going to analyze this. I figured this is actually... Um, I had something different in mind as far as what I wanted to go ahead and cover uh, for today, but this is most appropriate, obviously, because yeah. this is New Year's Eve, we're going into a new year, and as a mindset and an attitude is what we should have uh, with regard to what we want God to do in our life, and what we can actually learn from uh, what Moses expressed here as his desires for God. Okay, this is something, even though this is Moses, different dispensation, He's in the Old Testament. He's under law. Uh, it's still applicable to us, not only just because it's you know it's preserved and it's profitable uh, for you know doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, but also because um, it's it's something that's uh, this specifically. We we'll we'll see. It, it's uh, just very appropriate for for our day and age here. Okay, so we saw, we see initially he starts off by Praising God, uh, he acknowledges God's character. He says of him that he's of old, he's of everlasting, um, or he's from everlasting to everlasting. He's he's been God. Okay, 
uh, he's been the dwelling place of them for generations. Spe that's specifically addressing the fact that he's been Israel's God. Okay, so in other words, he's, yes, the God of all flesh, uh, but in particular, in his case, he's Israeli, so it, it would be the God that's the one who formed the nation of Israel. He's been the nation of Israel's protector. And then we see he turns, verse 3, thou turnest to destruction, or thou turnest man to destruction, and say, is return to children of men. So in other words, God is one that is able to raise up to destroy. Verse 4, for a thousand years in thy sight are, but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Again, this is referencing the fact that uh, God's not limited with time. In other words, he's, he's been of old, he's been of everlasting. Uh, he's, you know, been forever. We have a starting point he never has. And though our time is fleeting, and that's the contrast that he's going to bring about, is that our time is fleeting, his isn't. So he's not limited, he's not restricted by anything. Well, we are. And that's what, that's, that's going to be the cause for uh, Moses' first request, is uh, the fact that we are fleeting. Uh, and he, 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 address, he, he addresses that for uh, verses 4 to 6, basically. It says, Thou carriest them away as with a flood, they are as asleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. Okay, just a, um, the, the quick nature of our life. And now he addresses the fact, his, omni uh, his omniscience. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in light of thy countenance. And then for all our days are past, away in wrath we spend our years as a tale that is told. Um, God sees, God knows. We know that. Uh, and so he addressed particularly here as far as secret sins, but he also knows and sees that which is good. In other words, <laughs> We normally uh, think of uh, God as like this big boogeyman, like oh, he's out to get me, you know, he's out to hit me, he's got the two by four, he's got the baseball bat ready to whack me or ready to shoot me down with a lightning bolt. And certainly if we're in sin, you know, you ought to be afraid. Uh, but the fact is, there is mercy with the Lord. His mercy is of everlasting. And so the thing is, you can cry out to him if you're, you know, you repent, you can, you can receive mercy. Uh, he's, he's merciful. That's, that's who he is. That's his nature. Uh, but the fact is, we don't have to be afraid of him. Uh, we're to draw nigh to him. Uh, we're to be in close fellowship with him. And though we may not, if we are serving him, uh, be acknowledged by man, the fact is, God sees and God knows. Um, now he's going to address also the, the fleeting nature of our life. Uh, for all our days are passed away as uh, in thy wrath we spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score years and ten, and if by reason of strength it be four score, yet it is strength, yet is there strength, uh, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of tempted to ask this, but who here fits this category? <laughs> uh, uh -oh. Three score years and ten. <laughs> okay. Almost Larry. Larry's like days away. Next, next year. Yeah. yeah. A year away. Okay. So you don't got much time left. Well, I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know that to be the case. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be. Moses, Moses lived to be 120, so he just... Yeah, he did. <laughs> but he, he does mention here is this, by, if by reason of strength they'd be four score. So the fact is, is um, on a, just on a practical level, um, if you apply yourself, you know, not just healthy, healthy lifestyle, but also exercising, you know. Now, granted, our lives as a vapor and it's God's you know determining as far as whether or not we have really long length or short length of that uh, as far as by our standards but the fact is we are promised uh, in a number of scripture with regard to uh, just that long life is actually a blessing from the Lord in particular if we honor our mother and a father you know that it may be well with you and that we may be that we may live long mm -hmm. and then also just as far as living justly, living righteously. Uh, if we live righteously, we live justly. Long life is a reward for that. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that to be the case. Uh, and also the fact that God is long-suffering. He's merciful towards us. Uh, he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Um, 
And so he cries out now, because of the fleeting nature of life uh, and because of the fact that God's eternal, he wants a few requests here. First one, verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts into wisdom. Teach us to number our days. All right. I have heard this numerous times, uh, not only just in class and when I was in Bible college as far as preach from chapel. Um, not, <laughs> I hate to admit this. I remember when I was first in college, um, I didn't know a whole lot about life, and then it was like real culture shock because... I didn't, I didn't have a clue what Bible college was going to be like. And I didn't have a clue. I expected, um, well, this is going to seem silly, but like I expected, like, okay, because uh, I, I, I was, I, I flunked <laughs> my English exam, so then I had to take bonehead English. So I was in there, and uh, the grammar portion of it, I don't recall ever having learned grammar beyond fifth grade. So I, I just was like, okay, this could be pretty cool. We're going to see how God created grammar and it, I don't know, I just like this, I thought, it was, oh, this is going to be really neat. And then I just realized, okay, it's just, okay, grammar. And then I remember like a lot of my professors would, it, it wasn't exclusive to me, but a lot of other guys kind of, we, we were expecting, okay, oh, we're going to get these great spiritual truths and then we would, <laughs> we would get chided, hey, shine your shoes, uh, iron your shirt, iron your pants brush your teeth, comb your hair. <laughs> and after a while, you're like, okay, man, what does this have to do with, you know, Bible or anything like that? Um, and I didn't, I, I didn't put two and two together right away. It took, a, it took a while for me to be able to put two and two together. But this has actual practical application. The fact is, um, now you're asking, okay, well, how does this tie in with this? Teach us a number of days. College? What's that? That's what you learned at Bible college? <laughs> no, I always learned a lot more. But I'm just saying that's what it felt like at my initial first semester there, when I when I when I got there, it was just like, okay, um, and again I'm not slamming it or anything like that. It was just that was something that I needed. That, it wasn't just me that needed that, but um, teach us to number our days. Now, somebody would come up and say, you need to plan. You need to have goals that are set, and then goals. Uh, should be uh, not manageable. The that's not the word I'm looking for. They should be realistic, attainable. Realistic, yeah. But um, and I would even you have to be able to measure them. They're measurable. That's the actual word I was looking for. Uh, in other words, you have you have to be able to track them. Uh, you ought to be able to break them down and have step by step as far as what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to achieve. Now, here's why you would say that from this. This isn't the only place in Scripture that you would see this, but here's the underlying mentality. Right? Why does he ask for wisdom and being able to number his days? I know this seems kind of silly, but why would he ask that? Because they're limited. Why would he have to number his days? So? Good. Larry said, because they're limited. Is there any other reason? To stay focused on Pardon. what's important. You, you can't... Um, okay, that's probably, I asked it too vague. I'm sorry. That's true. That's true as well. Both are true. Um, <laughs> I asked this too vague a question. If you aim for nothing, you're definitely going to hit it. In other words, you can't accomplish anything in life without a goal without purpose. You need to have a plan. Okay, I never understood it as a kid. I never understood it as a young adult. I had a, or at least I had a difficult time understanding it as a young adult. I just thought, okay, like, what's going to happen is going to happen. So enjoy, the, you know, just enjoy the ride. Ride the wave. Yeah, basically. <laughs> that's, that's how I was accustomed to living. And so it, it, never, it never really, you know, I, w I went into Bible college. <laughs> like, I didn't have a clue about the fact that, okay, you had to follow a curriculum. I just took whatever classes I wanted to take because it was like, okay, this is, now I would get scolded for that, but the thing was, I didn't, you know, I was like, well, I'm here to learn, so I don't care if I fail. I just want to learn. And, uh, it, you know, that's kind of dumb. But anyways, the thing is, um, 
you don't get anywhere like that. You can't do anything like that. That's, you don't, you're just going to end up floundering. You don't have, it's like you're yeah. aimless, rudderless, purposeless. Okay, you can't accomplish anything like that. Uh, God's, if you recall, well, okay, there's many of you that weren't here for this. Uh, God's created us with purpose. In other words, God's created us to be industrious. Uh, if we were to look in Genesis, when God created Adam, he put him in a garden, and he placed him there to tend the garden, and he placed him to work. Okay, that's original design. God created us to be industrious. Labor was always part of God's plan. Uh, the fact, mind you, if we look at every other aspect of creation in the creation account, uh, we see that there's production, uh, not just of man, but I'm saying like the trees. Why would they need to be tended? Why would the garden be need to be tended? Well, I, I, things would get out of control if they weren't tended to. But the fact is, what happens to fruit that's not picked? It's going to rot. Okay, so you need somebody to go ahead and pick it. Uh, what happens to, uh, I'm not much of a green thumb person, <laughs> I grew up in the city, but, well, okay, for, uh, like, um, animals, what happens when, uh, they, yeah, they, they get, they, you get overpopulation of things, like, when you have, uh, to, well, okay, here, we don't have, we don't really have deer here, well, you got the key deer, but it's not really deer. Uh, not like, not like up north. Um, alligators, okay. Every so often, they have an overpopulation, and so what happens is, uh, Florida, Wild, Florida Wildlife Commission allows for a number of tags to be able to go out, so you can go out and hunt them because they're becoming nuisance. They're getting in people's yards, eating people's pets, and that kind of stuff. And so, okay, we got to get them to where the population's under control, so that they're not being a nuisance. Uh, in particular, we see this more now uh, with the Burmese pythons. That is a combination of things as far as why they are out of control. Uh, one of the last major hurricanes that we had, not recent, but within, it would have been like in the 90s, that uh, we had a wildlife center that was researching that had them housed or whatever down in South Miami, uh, was destroyed and so they all went loose. And so they reproduce a lot quickly. And then you also have people that would have them as exotic pets and just let them go uh, to the wild. So now you have an overpopulation, so they're eating up all the uh, regular critters that are around. So now they have like, it's basically like open season. You know, <laughs> they can't pay you enough to be able to go ahead and, you know, just take whatever you want and destroy as many as you can uh, because they're destroying all the other wildlife that's in the area. Anyways, okay, that's beside the point. Um, you're not going to be able to accomplish anything if you do not have purpose if you do not have a plan for which to accomplish that. Okay, it's, it's fine to have a desire, uh, but you need a plan and you need steps in, in order to be able to accomplish that. Um, and they should be measurable because you want to be able to see whether or not uh, it was effective or where, wherein you were ineffective, where you can be better at. Uh, the fact is uh, we are not perfect, we are riddled with sin. And so we're not, we're not always going to be able to do everything as perfectly as we would like, but we can always be better. We can always strive for better. So here, Moses' desire teaches a number of days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Okay? The fact is we are limited in our time, yeah, and we're not, but we're not going to be able to accomplish anything that God has put in our hearts to do and what he has for us overall. Now, mind you, what are some things that God has for us as believers in this day and age now? Well, aside from the plan for our life, the way that we can actually be useful for His service, He has victory for us, where we can actually have joy and peace and have a reason to live every day and have a perspective on the difficult things that we face in our lives. Yes. Yes, definitely. Uh, go to Ephesians 4. <clears throat> <coughs> this is going to be like being a dead horse in a sense uh, not just from me but from pastor's perspective alright starting at verse 11 and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some pastors or some evangelists and some pastors and teachers verse 12 for the perfecting of the saints 
for the work of the ministry, uh, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now we can go on and we can see the scope of that, which is basically until Christ returns. Right? Um, but, uh, and if we were to go to 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 13, 14, uh, and then even in Romans 12, we would see correlated that we are members within a body. Okay, now, he's given some, so now not everybody obviously is called to be an evangelist or a pastor teacher. Apostles and prophets are no longer standing, so the apostles and prophets now in this day and age are what would be the Word of God. That's where they're preserved. But um, evangelists, pastors, teachers, he's given to some so that the saints, through their ministry, would be perfected. And now also he's given to them as far as I would you would venture to say to the individual local church uh, so that the saints, which is all of us, would be perfected or matured so that we all would perform the work of the ministry together. So it's not exclusive to evangelists, pastors, teachers, work of the ministry. It's all believers work of the ministry. Right? So God's desire, God's plan is that we would mature so that we would... Now we see that also in Hebrews where he speaks of the fact that the Hebrew believers that were um, basically turning back to Judaism because of the persecution that they were experiencing uh, were not growing. They weren't allowing themselves to be exercised uh, by the experiences, by, by the hardship. In other words, God allowed the hardship in their life for the, as a, a growing, maturing experience. And so um, they weren't allowing that to be the case. And so their senses were dull. So in other words, he couldn't speak to them uh, it's like in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, he, in other words, they were carnal. They weren't where they should be for the time that they had been saved. God expected, to them, expected of them to be teachers. Uh, we go through, uh, not just later on uh, in chapter 4 and chapter 5, but also in, you look in, uh, towards the uh, end chapters of Galatians, and then also in Colossians of the fact that uh, some of the responsibilities of individuals within the church as far as Older are to teach younger. Uh, aged women teach the younger women uh, to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Uh, and you see countless commands of the fact that experienced Christians, maturing Christians, are ones that seek out ones that are might not yet mature to instruct them in the ways of the Lord. Okay, that's God's plan. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. Uh, and law I'm with you all even until the end of the world. That's God's plan. That's God's desire. Now, how do we fit into that? And that's where 1 Corinthians and uh, 12 and 12 to 14, and then also in Romans 12, specifically addresses where we have been gifted by God and placed in a body uh, with a specific gift, at least one uh, for a specific purpose. Now, that might be uh, he uses the illustration of a body, body parts. Okay, you might be a finger. You might be a hand, you might be an eyeball, you might be an ear, but the fact is wherever you are, you belong, and you need to be actively exercising yourself in that manner. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the body's not what it's going to need to be. It's going to be functioning, but it's going to be functioning as if it were ill or defective in some manner. It's going to be, um, well, I, to some degree, crippled, you know, and that's a woeful choice that we have to actively make. All right, so that's one thing. God's placed us in a body. He's gifted us, particularly so that we would act within that body uh, for the fulfilling of this in particular, and that is the touring of the saints for the work of ministry. Now, work of ministry is twofold. It is reaching lost people for Christ and then saved people, which they, we should be provoking one another unto love and to good works. Uh, okay, go back to Psalm 90. Psalm 90. So he asks, okay, teach us a number of days and we might apply our hearts, might apply our hearts unto wisdom. That's not his only request here. Uh, verse 13. Okay, return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. Alright, so, mind you, this is Moses, and this would be towards the end of his life. What is, well, Okay. <laughs> They're wandering in the wilderness. All right. Now, he has personally forfeited his privilege 
and gifting of being able to lead the children into the promised land because of his disobedience when he smote the rock rather than having spoken to it. And he's, I guess you could say, numbered to a degree with the generation that did not believe God whenever the spies came back. And then you had ten of them give evil report of what God had promised to them about the promised land. And so now he's going to pass off. He's not going to be able to be privileged to be able to go ahead and walk with them. And then you have the fact that, okay, it seems like it's doom and gloom. You have judgment on the nation, even though God said that the ones that are basically under 20 are going to be the generation that are going to be going forward into the promised land, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, which they, well, in particular, Joshua would be the one that would be raised up following Moses to be able to lead them in. So he says unto them, his request is, return, return, and let it repent thee concerning thy sermons. In other words, I need forgiveness. I need cleansing and restore unto me the joy of my salvation. As if, well, as David would say whenever he had sinned. Okay? Um, he, he, he says that in verse 14. He says, Oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Okay? I need nearness. I need closeness. This speaks of God's presence. All right? I need to plan my days. I need to have that closeness of God's presence in my life. I need that touch of God in my life. Okay, I need that relationship. And that comes primarily from me, one, uh, being clean from sin and then drawing nigh to God. The Bible says if I draw nigh to him, he's going to draw nigh to me. I need his presence. I need, I, I need him in my life. Okay, I can't go forward. I can't. <laughs> I'm not smart enough to get, well, I'm barely smart enough to get through a day, but I certainly am not smart enough to be able to go ahead and guide my life as something that is going to be profitable that I could bring before God and have Him say, you know, well done. Where He's going to be pleased. Where he, Well, He'll acknowledge, okay, hey, well done. Uh, and so I need Him. And the fact is, uh, God's presence is something that. Uh, it, we should be sought. We should seek. Um, it's needful. His other quest. Okay, verse 15. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us in the evil, uh, in the evil years when uh, we have seen evil. In other words, that's the restoration of the joy. Okay, Lord, we've seen, you've chastised us. We've seen a lot of bad. Show us a token for good. In other words, I want to see you bless. I want to see your hand of blessing. Uh, now he's going to ask specifically for a few other things in, in regard to that. Verse 16, let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. Okay, not just for them, but for the future generation. They need to see God work and they need to see the hand of God, the power of God in their life as well. And so he cries out and he asks for specifically the fact that they want to see God. Um, what was it that, if you can recall, that Gideon had said to the angel of the Lord whenever the angel of the Lord came to him and called him? If I be a man of God, you know, why, if I'm a man of God, if I'm a mighty man of valor, then why are, why are we hiding? Why, you know, why am I hiding? I, I believe he was harvesting, right? He was, trying to, he was trying to hide his harvest so that it wouldn't be taken by the he was, yeah, he was harvesting in secret, yeah. Yeah, so he's like, if I'm such a mighty man, why am I sneaking around harvesting? I believe, I, I want to say, I recollect Yes, that. okay, yeah. So, yeah, he did say that. <laughs> that wasn't the answer you are looking for. No, but he did, that goes along, okay. What he <laughs> said, in addition to that, was the fact that we have heard from our fathers, yet we have not seen. In other words, they had heard from their fathers of... God's mighty acts. Now, they're not too, too far removed from the Exodus and even going into the Promised Land, but the mm -hmm. fact was they had seen, or at least previous generations had seen God work there in present in bondage to the Philistines, and they can't even have weapons. They don't even have weapons. They don't have the ability to be able to have weapons. Uh, and so here we are 
mind you, children of the living God, okay, the nation who has God's laws, who else has that? Who exclusively has the ability to be able to have access to the presence of God? We do. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, this ain't age. I'm <laughs> back then. Nobody. Yeah, nobody else did. Only Israel. All right. Well, we do now because we have the blood of Christ if we've been born again. Okay. So we're covered by the blood of Christ and we're able to go into the holiest of all and to the throne of grace. Uh, and mind you, he, you know, he wants us to come. He wants us to come boldly. Mind you, boldly is freely with access as if it were my own place. All right, so uh, nobody else had that. But his, his cry to them was the fact that we haven't seen this. You know, our fathers have said of you, but we haven't seen this. In other words, his cry to them is, God, show us this. You know, okay, for our day and age, well, <laughs> we don't. Well, I shouldn't say we don't so much here. Uh, but if, uh, well, okay. I recall, uh, again, this is a slam against anybody. I recall, like, being a baby Christian in my home church and hearing of all these great men that were greatly used in years past. And um, I didn't know anybody from Adam, you know, so somebody mentioned something. I personally like history, so I just, okay, in my notebook, write down a name, and then I go ahead and read about, okay, wow, that was really neat that they had these uh, great city-wide campaigns where it seemed like like the whole city came out and got saved, you know, and then you have like, um, you know, bars were shut down, um, brothels were shut down, you know, and then it was like, you, yeah, you had op opposition from Saint, obviously, and you had a lot of people that uh, suffered uh, some pretty bad things, but the fact was it was like, and, you know, God's, God's moving in a great way. Uh, or you see just the fact that, like, even firsthand, where, um, you know, we were praying for somebody. This dude was, you know, really militant atheist, or he was really militant anti-God, and all of a sudden it's like God gets all of his heart, breaks down just because we were praying for him. Uh, and then he gets saved. And, or you just see, wow, boom. Uh, somebody on a mission field, like a, a Bob Hughes or Rick Martin, okay, well, those guys in the Philippines, okay, see, like, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of scores of people just saved. Uh, it seems like uh, anywhere they go, it's like, boom, you know, scores of people getting saved all over the place. Uh, and so now here it is, it's like, okay, we're here, and uh, again, this isn't a slam I'm doing or anybody here, but like I'm just saying, all right, where are the droves of people? <laughs> okay, when we go knocking on doors, I mean, how many do we come across before we find somebody that's actually, like, really receptive? That actually wants, that will let us go through the whole gospel plan. Mm -hmm. And then even then, as far as that, are, like, you know, hungry. Yeah, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical or, or saying anything negative, but then it's like, okay, you want to, you hear of that, and it's like, okay, you want to see that, but at the same time, it's like, okay, wait a minute, God, you, we're not limited. You're not limited. Uh, and we're only limited, I guess, in that, our unbelief. Okay, so we need to, obviously, step on faith, but the fact is, I guess, his desire, God, show us your glory. Show us your glory. He had seen it. Now, mind you, this is Moses, obviously. He led the people through uh, the Red Sea. Uh, they were led by a cloudy pillar in the daytime, by the fire at night. Um, you know, he got the... <laughs> now, this is, well, I don't know, it would be kind of interesting to see. I don't think I personally want to handle this, but like, you know, cast down the rod and then turn it, to, and it turns into a snake, and then they pick it back up by its tail, and then boom, it's a rod again. You know, you got the whole leper's hand. You got um, manna. <laughs> you know, that's pretty cool. Uh, it doesn't seem like a big significant thing, but the fact is, hey, yeah, manna that falls from the sky every day uh, to provide for you. You got water out of a rock out in the middle of desert. I don't know if any of y'all, 
you know, I haven't. <laughs> so I can't speak like it's, well, yeah, I've been. I've been to the desert, like out in uh, California, but I've never been to uh, the Negev, you know. So I don't know if they're comparable. But uh, I heard it's pretty dry and pretty barren out there. Uh, anyway, so you have that. He's seen it. And it seems as if, okay, God's judgment is on him. God, I want your presence. God, restore unto us our, the joy. God, work in our life. And then he says, verse 17 to finish off, Let the beauty of, a, of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. What work would that have been for them? This is Israel in the wilderness. They haven't even gone to the promised land. And most of the generation that's there is going to die off in the wilderness, along with Moses. Teaching the younger generation and then putting up camp, tearing it down, moving, putting up camp. As you wander and wander and wander. Mm -hmm. How else you have to do? Yeah. Well, primarily it's going to be the teaching. You're going to have the teaching yeah. of the generation. You want them. Uh, he was very particular about that. Not just Moses and recounting in Deuteronomy, but also in Joshua, uh, that they should not depart from the words of the Lord. So they need to be very diligent in being able to pass on what truths they had learned from God. Now, the younger generation may not have been all as cognizant of what God had been doing earlier, but the fact is they were there present. A large number of them would have been and they would have seen and God's command for them in whenever they would set up monuments, landmarks. He wanted them to be instructed to be communicated the fact, okay, this is what God did here then. So that they would have in their hearts uh, and just as a visual reminder of the fact that, hey, this is God. He's real. He's active. And that's cultivating a heart for God. Okay, But yeah, you want the cultivation of the heart for God. Now that, that would have been theirs in particular. What would be ours? I would say the same. But we have a little bit more expanded realm. Okay? Uh, you know, we may not... Well, okay, like, in my case, I'm saying going on with kids. All right? But I have a sphere of influence. Okay? You, you know, may not have children, but you have a sphere of influence in your life as far as believers and unbelievers that you can testify, and if you're faithful, uh, you can see God work in their life with regard to them being drawn to him. Okay, And so we need to uh, be diligent. We need God's power in order to be able to see that work and have that work be established and have it be something that is going to be profitable uh, for eternity. All right, so these are lessons that we can learn and that we need to take into this coming year with regard from Moses' prayer. Uh, we need to number our days. Okay, We need to plan. Uh, we need uh, to be satisfied with God's mercy or we need to see satisfaction with God's mercy. We need to be rejoicing in Him. Uh, we also need God's power to be able to have our work be established. And then we should be desiring and asking for God to be able to work, or to work, rather, uh, that his work would appear unto thy servants and, to the, and thy glory and to their children. All right, as we turn to Hebrews 11. Verse 13 down to 16, and then I'll jump down to verse 36. Um, okay, verse 13, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. 
For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly if, there had been, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity re, uh, to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Okay, this is in particular speaking of, uh, if you, in the context, it would have been immediately of Sarah and then Abram, where she bore a child after childbearing age, and uh, Abram was faithful, um, even though he was a lousy husband. But he, he was he was he was counted faithful. He believed God in his uh, <coughs> kind of righteousness, and then also he be, he did believe God, and he was um, he. Was, he saw his child born, but he didn't actually see as the sand of the seashore or as the stars in the sky, as the stars in heaven would be born. He saw it in faith, but he didn't actually practically, within his lifetime, see it. Okay? And then you have Sarah, the same thing, uh, and any number. Now, he says of them, they died that way, but God was not ashamed to be called their God because they believed him. In other words, they were faithful. All right. Verse 36. Uh, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, even more over bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Okay. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. Okay, God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Okay, so now this is a second category. He had just uh, delineated, if you look in the context a little previous to 36, a number of folks that did actually receive promise. You know, uh, the mouths of the lions were stopped. Uh, you had uh, righteousness that was wrought in kingdoms. Uh, dead receive, or the dead were raised to life again, uh, and a number of other different. Um, and you know, some time would fail, uh, would fail me to tell you of, and you could go on and on and on as far as like people that actually receive great answers to prayer and great amazing work of God. And you had a second category of people that died and were miserably treated and uh, didn't receive any of that stuff, right? That's not something that is, I guess you could say, desirable, <laughs> humanly speaking, to be in that category. But here's what God says of them. He says of them that they were not worthy. And he's also, I guess you could say, alluding back to verse 16, where he speaks of the same people that didn't receive promise in their lifetime. He says of them, he's not ashamed to be called their God. All right. How does this apply to this Almighty? All right. We want to see God's power. It's almost like we need it so that we can have, it's a desire, it's a strong desire. Um, but the fact is we live by faith. That's not saying that God can't work or God's not going to work or that's a cop-out. But the fact is uh, the truths in this book are real. We need to live as if God's going to answer and work in this manner uh, passionately, right? Because if we don't, uh, we're not going to be pleasing to God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And we're not going to be able to communicate or transfer not just the truth that's been entrusted to us, uh, but we're not going to be able to... Uh, that's, that's really the heart of the relationship as far as our walk with God. Right? He's real. And I, I, I take Him at His word. Uh, that's Christian life in a nutshell. I mean, that's that's the basis. That's yes. Uh, just going to add that you know, going back to tying in what you've been talking about, a key word in there that you use, cultivate, is really critical because the number of days, you know, even if you do everything right, say you, you do have a soul winning uh, schedule, you go out, you feel you're uniquely gifted, you you do all these things right, and you still don't get the results. That just being one area or, or another area, like, and now it's coming towards the end where of uh, what you're 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 af uh, talking about here is that's what separates genuine faith, true faith, from emotional. 
you got to cultivate and as your journey as a Christian to mature and go through all these things because you 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 it's not enough uh, uh, to believe you you have to nurture and cultivate your your walk with the Lord and the learning of it and yes. keep keep that moving forward. That's where you get the genuine because the the hard times come, the tough stuff comes. Even when you do things right, it's not working out. Well, what keeps you glued to 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 your faith your, in in God is the knowledge and the, the working and being in the book and devotionals and all that stuff that you've cultivated all along. Yes, sure. Yes, very good point. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's the truth because the fact is, um, I mean, ultimately I'm responsible for me, but the fact is those within my sphere of influence, uh, when we stand before God, well, not just me, but I would hope uh, to be all of us, we want to be said as far as, okay, yeah, not only, yeah, were you faithful, but this, you know, they tasted, they tasted of God, they tasted and saw, you know, His goodness, His power, His might. Now, Moses actually got to see it, but there was others that they may not have experienced it in their life, but they did see it as if, and that's, that's, that was what he was getting at in Hebrews 11. And that's why, okay, the world's not, the world's not worthy. Uh, and they, uh, they're, God's not ashamed to be called their God, because the fact is, it's, he's just as real to them in just the reading of the words as he was in the actual acting out or the action of it. And so the thing is, God, that's how that's how we're going to be pleasing to God, and that's how this year, uh, if we take this, uh, we take these truths, are going to be where this year is going to be, uh, you could say, life-changing, not just for us, but for those within our sphere of influence, where we can actually make uh, an eternal impact, you know, where... You know, God, God's going to reward and God's going to please. Or God's going to be pleased. All right, does anybody have any questions or things? All right. If not, uh, next week we're going to be going, starting our series on uh, words in context. And then if you, again, if you have anything as far as you would like to see covered or addressed or whatever, uh, just let me know. And uh, you're dismissed. Thanks, bro. This work Yeah, Microphone hater. No, I need to speak up louder though. How are you? Good. You, you fight it. You project <laughs> away from it. You're a rebel. You guys want to do it? Good morning. How are you? Good morning. 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 Good
Oh, this time it's uh, short. Time. Here. Did your parents come? Did your parents come? Your mom and dad? Did they come? No. Are they okay? Are you doing all right? Hello. How are you? Can play a couple, but yeah. It's cold up there right now. Yeah. You picked a really good week to not be in Massachusetts. <laughs> Jimmy Stewart and Shenandoah. He brings his family to church of boisterous boys. Come 